again, I encourage you all, uh, if you're not lecturing, if you don't mind to turn on your camera uh, uh, so that you know, your presenters will have something else to look at uh, besides uh, the screen that they're sharing. Okay, and I think we're good. All right, um, I'm gonna keep that in the background, probably turn it off later, but I wanted to go to the steps uh, system. So um, especially for all of us who are doing projects, so that's all of our 6101 students uh, and external participants, uh, you guys have already formed into groups, which is great. Uh, the next step uh, you should be doing is getting ready to uh, advertise your project on STEPS. Um, for those who are not aware of how the system works, uh, STEPS is a semesterly um, showcase uh, um, in our school of computing that lets all students uh, advertise what they've done in their semester long projects to external participants sorry, external people, you know, uh, basically members of the general public who are interested. Sometimes we think of this as like a reverse career fair where uh, students who've done good work in projects now have something to talk about and the recruiters are not selling, um, uh, you know, their company to you, but rather coming to you to understand what you've done and seeing whether you might be a good fit for their company. This is especially in the case of master students and, and also our fourth year um, final year students, they participate in this. But it's also a good way to get in touch with uh, other members of the larger Singaporean community who might be uh, doing things that are interested or like-minded as you. Okay, so what I've done is I've taken our, um, our lecture choice worksheet, uh, which I'm sure you've seen so many times now that it's uh, not funny, um, uh, and try to put all of your projects uh, that you discussed, all right, uh, here into uh, the STEPS uh, website. So I think uh, you saw that on the last screen. Okay, so we have a, a number of different projects, uh, all uh, preliminary at this point. And some of you have already gone in. I think uh, Sunil has gone in his, and at least and added his uh, uh, description. Okay, so um, you can just go to uh, your project because you should have received an email from the system. It might have gone to your span because it goes to, uh, it comes from a VM, which is uh, in AWS. Because so many people use AWS, you, you get a lot of spam mail from AWS IP. So check your spam mail. Okay, um, if you haven't gotten it, let me know. Uh, I can resend it. But uh, what you should be doing is assigning at least one member of your group to go add information. Okay, so um, that could be, for example, adding a description of uh, what is the project, um, adding an image uh, of what you want to advertise. Uh, it could be something um, just uh, attention grabbing image, or it could be something that is. Uh, 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 scientifically uh, interesting, okay. And then later on during the, the actual steps, you'll actually add a poster, right? The, the poster that you're presenting into the system too. And then uh, depending on whether it's going to be actually in place, meaning um, you will go down to SOC in, um, in, uh, in Clementi uh, to advertise your project or whether it's going to be completely virtual. I haven't gotten the details for that yet. So we'll find out hopefully next week, uh, what, what's exactly the, the logistics for it, okay? Steps happens in week 13, so uh, it's in uh, uh, early November for that. Um, and I think you all have a, a, a very good time. I think it's, uh, I think it is uh, November, but let me double check the schedule for that. I'm gonna check a different course and, and see uh, what timing it is. Cause I, I Just let me check that. Um, when is week 13? Yeah, so week 13 is November 9th. So it's a uh, steps is actually on the uh, Wednesday, November 11th. Um, even though this is a different class, this is our undergraduate machine learning class, steps is uh, common for that class too. Um, so it'll be at that time. So you do need to make that time free, whether or not you're uh, a 6101 participant as a first year PhD student 
or as an external participant participating in this course. Okay, okay. so uh, please take the time for that. Okay, so um, uh, you need to go in and add, uh, add the abstract that you've put on the project channel. And um, over the weekend, I will be uh, giving you some feedback on, on each of the projects uh, as you go along. And I noticed there are a couple of teams that are still thinking of forming. If you, uh, you know, projects are, I think, much better when it's done in a group of at least two. So if you want to do a singleton project, uh, see whether you can combine forces with someone and, and put together something. Uh, it is harder to coordinate, of course, but it's much more rewarding because you're doing it with another person and you get to, to um, add a little bit more um, uh, social interaction, especially because, you know, these days with COVID, it's really hard to, to go out of your box, you know, you're sort of forced into a, a small box uh, wherever you are in social isolation. Okay, um, so that's all I wanted to talk with you about uh, what I wanted to share. I'm gonna drop my screen share and uh, now uh, let our presenters go uh, through uh, what they are doing. So Alex, I think is starting first, so uh, we'll let him take it away. Okay. Hi everyone, uh, I am Alex, uh, first year PhD student. And uh, yeah, today we, my team and I will be presenting uh, on a follow-up of what we discussed last week about uh, synthetic data generation for uh, MRC, uh, machine reading comprehension. So just to uh, recap, it is, um, it is about learning, uh, teaching the machine how to read and answer questions. Yeah, essentially. So uh, let me just expand this. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, let me know if I get stuck halfway or my internet connection is not good or anything. Yeah, if not, we can um, start this. So let me pull out the pointer. Uh, okay. Yeah, you can type on the chat also if you have any um, questions along the way. Yeah, then uh, we can discuss them. Okay, so uh, firstly, so um, the paper that I'm discussing is a triple AI paper uh, published uh, this year actually. So um, it is about unsupervised domain adaptation on reading comprehension. So um, uh, just an introduction about the, the task. So, um, Unsupervised domain adaptation, uh, the problem is motivated by noticing that uh, BERT and other um, neural networks perform very well on supervised uh, reading, reading comprehension tasks. Uh, however, um, usually in the real world, when we try to apply these trained models, uh, we observe that there are only um, unlabeled data. So uh, we have to, in a way, project these um, models train models to the to the uh to these unseen and unlabeled data that come from a different distribution so uh, that is the observation and um we also observe uh later there are some um, empirical results that show that uh but does not generalize well uh, between different domains because uh due to divergence in both the corpora and the question forms so the approach of this uh paper presented is to transfer knowledge from the labeled source domain to the unlabeled target domain, and uh, hopefully to reduce the distributional shift. Yeah, so um, they propose this uh, conditional adversarial self-training uh, algorithm case, which consists of three components. So firstly, we have the, the pre-trained but feature network, uh, the output network, and the discriminator network. Uh, for those familiar with serial adversarial neural networks, uh, this should be familiar. Um, and there are three training steps. So firstly, you, uh, I'll go over these steps in detail, but basically the overview is, um, uh, firstly, the BERT feature model and the output network is fine-tuned on the source domain. And then self-training is performed on the target domain. And finally, we have um, conditional adversarial uh, training on both domains to uh, reduce for the feature distribution diversity. Okay, so the step one in the training is 
can you sum summarize in this uh, diagram. So um, basically, uh, we take the pre-trained blood model and um, uh, let me check this. Okay, yeah. So we take the pre-trained blood, blood model and, and uh, we fine tune it on the source domain. So um, the 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 source domain is X with um, with the pathogen and the, the base and uh, Q and uh, but um, so we basically train this uh, model on the source domain. Yeah, and uh, basically uh, the the loss that is used is this uh, combined cross entropy loss. Yeah, so um, this is for step one. Uh, step one, yeah, it, it's pretty sure therefore is the usual way of uh, training the uh, neural network and secondly the second step is a bit more interesting so it consists of self-training uh, for those familiar with um, self-supervised uh, I mean uh, semi-supervised or self-supervised learning techniques um, there are two approaches uh, self-training and co-training so this paper presents using the self-training method which uh, which is summarized in this diagram so basically um, we uh, we take the target domain and there are two steps. Um, there's a prediction component. So we take the pre-trained model in the previous step. We use that model to uh, predict on the unseen uh, different distribution target uh, domain data and output certain pseudo labels. Uh, we filter these pseudo labels, um, those with high confidence and uh, we train the model in a way we fine tune the same model again on these um, on, on the target domain inputs with the pseudo labels yeah so uh, self training basically uh, consists of the prediction step and using the prediction to train the model again yeah so uh, this is the self training approach and something to note uh, additional detail is that um, the uh, for a given uh, um, target uh, sequence. So uh, given the question, the, the model is supposed to output like start, uh, supposed to output start and end of the passage to find the answer, the, uh, the respective uh, answer to the query. So um, we note that the passage length is usually very large. So uh, this, if you apply softmax function over all the upper logics, um, the, the numerical values will be very small. So what they propose is to um, take the, the end best predictions and um, uh, so you have a number of end best predictions with the highest number of uh, the highest value for the logics and then you take the and then after that you apply the softmax. So you in a way you process the logics so that the numerical value output is uh, not too small and thus uh, small meaningful. Yeah, so they propose this because their, the passage length is very large. Okay, then the final prediction will be this output. So we have that the, uh, the softmax of the sum of the start and end uh, indexes. Uh, we take the max value to find the prediction and if this prediction is more than the threshold and referring to the previous slide, uh, we filter these predictions and we uh, we input uh, this pair of data to the to fine tune the model further. So this is how um, the self training is done. Yeah. So uh, finally, we have the last step, which is um, adversarial training. So um, how they propose to do this is uh, given the feature network uh, and the uh, uh, so there are two steps. So firstly, um, uh, the same model has, yeah, no lagging. Okay. Yeah, so the, the, the feature network has uh, two steps. Firstly, the features are output, and then um, the output network outputs the predictions or the logic. Yeah, so you have the features and the logic. So this, people, this paper notes that um, usually adversarial training uh, for those familiar also, uh, usually the training is only done on the features instead of the, the logics because uh, they are assumed to be um, consistent. 
across different domains. Uh, however, for MRC, usually this is not the case. So uh, they propose to use both the features and the output predictions to uh, train the discriminator network for the adversarial training. So uh, basically, this step involves the random sampling. Uh, I won't go into detail of the equation. Uh, you can refer to the paper, but uh, essentially um, it performs uh, ran randomized uh, linear sampling to extract out um, values of the respective features and the, the output logics so that this final uh, ZR that is inputted into the discriminator network is not too large. Yeah, because without the random sampling, uh, it will be explosive in the base complexity. Yeah, so uh, yeah, this is essentially the, the adversarial training. So this is the third step. So after we self perform self training on the model, then um, uh, we perform this adversarial training, which discriminates between the, the source domain and the target domain, so that uh, the the representations in the feature network and the output network uh, get refined to uh, to in a way acknowledge the different uh, domains. Yeah. So, um, and so there's an additional uh, thing that uh, they propose also. So they have two versions of this algorithm. One is the case and the case plus E. Basically, um, the first case assumes that each uh, discriminated sample is uh, equal, whether or not uh, doesn't depend on how difficult it is to determine whether it's uh, from source or target. They take every sample as equal. However, the second proposed loss function is takes the entropy of uh, of uh, that uh, identifies um, the easier that gives higher weight to the easier uh, discriminated uh, examples, so that the network pays more attention to these examples instead of the ones that. Um, are harder to determine. Yeah, so this is the entropy loss. Okay, so um, just to um, uh, bring the whole model together, so uh, so basically, uh, given an input um, passage and queries, we want to get their respective uh, parts of the passage which gives the answer. So to do this, they have three steps. Um, the training on source domain, second step, the self-training on the target domain, uh, given this pre-trained model. And uh, finally, we, we use uh, conditional adversarial learning to, um, to fine tune the, the features and the output uh, linear layers. Yeah, so this is re repeated for uh, a few epochs, yeah. Okay, and um, so finally, um, we, uh, the algorithm is summarized as such as a as a very big uh, 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 quite a long um, algorithm so basically uh, if you refer to the previous slide uh, this portion is the first part where just a regular training <laughs> on the soft domain and then uh, the second part uh, the second part is actually the second loop is actually the whole uh, bottom part which is uh, just briefly the the first part um, does the self-training portion, yeah, and um, the the second portion does the adversarial training, yeah. So uh, you can look over this in more detail. Uh, yeah. So um, going through the experiments, so um, what they what they did was uh, they took a few uh, data sets with. Uh, questions and answers of different forms. Uh, you can do summarized up here. And um, uh, basically there is, a, there is an annotation later that I will uh, cover that shows the similarities between uh, these data sets. Yeah, so, uh, and uh, additional note is uh, these two data sets, CNN and Daily Mail, have a lot of training and example uh, uh, training and test data. So what they did was they downsampled this one to be more equivalent to the rest, the squad, the news, yeah, which have a lower, relatively lower number of samples. So um, firstly, this portion of the experiments hopes to analyze um, the ability of BERT to 
generalize without their whole algorithm. So it is the, it is the benchmark, basically. So uh, they call it with zero shot because it just trained on the row, the source data sets over here and tested on this. So uh, what is interesting to see is that uh, uh, that all the results um, are, are basically we experience a 50% reduction compared to uh, models trained on the target data set. So this, um, the self represents the models that are trained on um, these data sets directly. Yeah, instead of uh, training on this and then um, you know, testing on this. Yeah, so, uh, so we can see that um, all the, the, uh, the values uh, experience uh, a significant decline, um, except uh, some, some of the, some of the uh, data sets which are more similar, like uh, the CNN to Daily Mail. So training on CNN and testing on Daily Mail um, does not provide that much of a difference because of the similar, similarity, which we can see here. Uh, so they plotted out the similarities and um, something interesting to note here is that uh, these um, shapes represent the, the question form. So um, uh, rectangles re represent closed and circle represents natural and uh, the note color represents the corpus. So uh, the, the source of the passages. So uh, we can see that uh, the data sets, um, the closer they are represents the more similar they are. So uh, based on the previous scores here, so um, we can see that the circle ones, uh, they are closer together, which sim symbolizes that uh, they, the data sets cluster more significantly to the question forms instead of the, the copper. Yeah, so uh, there's an there's a interesting observation. So using this observation, uh, they developed the case, which uh, comes out with these results. So um, compared to the previous table, uh, we can actually see that uh, there's a lot of improvement um, uh, that is uh, being done. So uh, when, uh, let's focus on the first part over here, um, which, is the, which is the case plus E, so with the entropy loss uh, covered earlier for the adversarial training, uh, we can see that um, compared to the cell, which is just uh, training on the squad and testing it directly, uh, Compared to the squad, we can see that um, the uh, the squads are very similar to uh, if they were already trained on this data set directly. So, which which is good because we are um, we are basically training on a on a very different data set from the one that we are applying the train model on. Yeah. So uh, you can see that yeah, basically the the meta works. <laughs> fortunately, so. Uh, yeah, the more interesting stuff uh, are as follows. So um, the ablation study uh, uh, consists of um, the, the rows, the columns here represent um, basically training on the first uh, data set and uh, testing on the second one. So C2S, E2C, C2N, uh, yeah, as follows. And um, we observe that uh, uh, the case plus uh, the case, if we remove the conditional adversarial component to it, uh, then uh, the results are basically deproved slightly. Uh, similarly, for the if we remove the entire adversarial training, uh, some of the results are deproved. And the, we know that the most significant um, uh, decrement of results would be when we remove the self-training component. So the case minus the self-training, uh, we get terrible results. Yeah, as compared to uh, with it. So um, we can conclude that self-training plays a very big role in this um, study, uh, in this algorithm. And uh, another interesting analysis is that um, uh, after we do the whole case algorithm and uh, we try to generalize the model on the two data sets, uh, we test it on the original source data set that is pre-trained on. And uh, we observe that uh, because the model becomes more general, um, the, 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 the score for the, the performance for the source donate domain actually deproves yeah, after this whole case uh, algorithm. So you can see that um, just uh, 
um, if you train it on the C alone and test it on C, then you get this score. However, if you run the case algorithm on C to S and then you test it again on the C, then you get these scores. Yeah. So uh, you can see that it decreases, it, uh, the performance have, has uh, decreased yeah, because of its higher generalizability. Yeah. So this is interesting also. And yeah, so um, just to conclude, so uh, it's interesting to see that um, in most real world applications, uh, uh, the data set is unseen and probably very different from that of the training set. So um, we note that BERT does not generalize well between different domains due to divergence in both uh, the corpora and the, sorry, the, both the corpora and the question forms. So yeah, uh, to summarize the main idea, so the an unsupervised alignment approach is uh, is is studied, uh, and um, the case algorithm is proposed, which has the following steps. So fine tune on the bird model, on the source domain, and um, uh, and iteratively uh, fine tune the model using self training and conditional adversarial learning on the target domain. Yeah. So uh, and you know that. Uh, using this, it provides similar performance to self-supervised uh, train on the target domain. Yeah, so, uh, and I guess it's very interesting because um, personally, I'm from a, a CNN uh, computer vision, more of a background than actual language processing. And uh, this this problem of generalizability between train set and the, and so to say, the, the, the different test set of a different domain is uh, very relevant also. And uh, yeah. I thought I might try a form of this for my own research. <laughs> so yes, that's it for uh, this paper. Thank you. And uh, if you have any questions, yeah, go ahead. We can discuss. Okay. Thanks, Alex, for sharing mm -hmm. the presentation. So let's give him a round of applause for that. Thank you. So um, good questions from anyone. Any questions that you guys have? Yes, yeah, thanks, Alex. And I have a question related to the conditional adversary learning. And uh, there is a, a table related to ablation study, and uh, we can find that uh, when we remove the conditional uh, one, the performance is quite similar to the adversary learning. So I have no idea what it helps. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. Actually, yeah, I, I also question uh, whether uh, how much better is the, the adversarial? Uh, actually, this is um, if we remove the conditional one. So uh, the conditional, um, it means because usually adversarial learning, we just uh, do on the features, right? The, uh, yeah, just the features without the, the output uh, prediction. So if you do it just on the features, then uh, I think it improves just a bit. But if you just remove the whole adversarial learning, I think there's not much of a difference. <laughs> so um, I guess the whole the takeaway is uh, the adversarial learning might not um, benefit that much. I think the, the self-training is the one that benefits the both. So if you remove it, yeah, it, the adversarial learning, it, it, could, it could be enough and it could save you computational cost, I guess, <laughs> based on my analysis. Mm -hmm. um, Hi Alex. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I really don't understand the intuition behind this conditional adversarial learning. Like, hmm. uh, what what does that do? Like, why is there an arrow mark between the output network and the discriminator network in your slide eight? Why why is like, there anything from the paper? Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, like, uh, yeah, I mean. Uh, hmm. So the whole point is to learn domain invariant representation, right? Yes. But yeah. why is there like an arrow mark from the output network to the discriminator network? The output uh, network is the question answering model, right? Yeah, the output is this. And uh, yeah, so so the, the, the whole point of the discriminator network is to um, acknowledge that there are two different, it is basically to help the the model understand that there's a different uh, set of domains of the input. So it's like there's a the source domain and the target domain. So in they 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 hope that in, in discriminating this, then uh, the gradients when you back propagate, it will help the the feature 
the whole network to, uh, in a way, uh, structure the features so that um, they can re recognize that these two are different. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think that's the... Uh, so what, what does this ZR of FG do? Oh, like F is okay. a random sample yeah. from feature. Yeah, so uh, this one basically, uh, because for usual adversarial training, uh, uh, I think usually you can, you can just take the feature and uh, go directly to the discriminator network. So you use the feature yeah. and go directly. But then um, because they, uh, they recognize that um, the, the, the data sets differ in, uh, in, both the uh, in both the passages and the answers, so they want to include the answers because uh, they acknowledge that um, for different data sets, the, the length, say the length of the answers could be very different. And um, if you, uh, so they think that this should be included so that they can better discriminate between uh, which comes from the source target or which uh, source domain or, or target domain. Uh, so, okay. So, so yeah. the whole thing is, okay, these are the, this, the, this, the mm. differences also exist in the, the answers kind of logics, and then we want we want the discriminator to get confused based on this as well. Yes. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Now it makes sense. Mm. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Yeah. So, yes. uh, yeah, just to build on the the uh, every data set has a different kind of answers. So one could be like uh, uh, a certain length, and, and another could be another length. Yeah. So they're trying to include this in the adversarial training. Uh, someone else had a question? Yes, uh, exactly. I want to add on is that uh, we can see that this conditional adversarial learning improves the result by a bit, but it still improves. And also did a ablation study on the conditional adversarial training and just adversarial learning. And the rationale for doing this is that it's mentioned in the paper is because it's insufficient, uh, just use the ad adversarial training, which means that if you just use the feature as the input, it's insufficient because the joint distribution of the feature and labels are different across different domains. That's why, that's the rationale behind why do they want to use this conditional adversarial learning. And uh, the result uh, turned out to be that doesn't differ by much. It's because of this uh, assumption. Maybe the source, uh, the source input the joint distribution doesn't differ by much. That's why this uh, doesn't improve that much. However, maybe for different data set, uh, if the joint distribution really differs by much, then this could help. So uh, it improves a bit, which means that if that assumption is true, the di joint distribution is different, then this will improve the result. Mm. Yeah. Right. Thanks. These are all very good questions. Uh, any other questions? Okay, uh, I think we're just on time. It's 1.30 and we have four papers. So I think uh, with that, let's thank Alex and all of our questioners again. And thank uh, you. on to our next paper. Uh, uh, yeah, so when you're ready, you can share and uh, you can start. Okay. Uh, okay, do you guys see my screen? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, uh, I think the two of our papers are quite uh, related to each other. So uh, we'll probably have some joint discussion going on uh, throughout. Uh, in any case, let me just start. So yeah, uh, the ability to answer a machine reading comprehension model trained on high resource domain to other low resource domain is critical for scalable MRC as we've just seen, right? And uh, it is easier to obtain large amounts of unlabeled text in the target domain compared to the uh, labeled ones or or it is also easier to collect and annotate question answers uh, from scratch. And so the paper I'm going to uh, discuss today is actually built upon a previous state of the art, which is SINNET. And SINNET was one of the papers that were trying to uh, discover this issue. So yeah, the, the way SINNET worked was basically uh, they just uh, had the source text and source questions and they, uh, using this, uh, they train a question answer generator. And using this question answer generator uh, in the target text, they just uh, first extract a, uh, a number of uh, answers using uh, named entity recognition, and then uh, create some 
synthetic questions conditioned on the passages and the answers, right? And what they do then is they just get the source and target data, uh, corpora, and they just mix them into a training set and train their models on this. And I guess it's probably much easier to answer this question after what Alex presented, but why do you think it might be wrong? Like what is uh, wrong with this process? Do any, like, does anyone have any idea? The translator may be noise. Mm -hmm. uh, noise is one thing, exactly. Yeah, that we, we're going to talk about that a lot, but there's uh, another issue that the paper assumes here. I will just wait for more, like 10 more seconds. Okay, so the, the actually the biggest problem here is that the paper assumes that uh, mixing the source and target data would not perform uh, in would not result in any performance degradation. However, uh, that is for most of the times is the case, right? Because as you can see, uh, the created synthetic data and source domain data in SimNet is quite. Uh, the clustered differently. And since they're using the source domain labeled data and target domain pseudodata uh, directly combined together without considering the domain differences, it actually causes uh, some form of uh, hurt in the performance, right? And so, yeah, this is called domain variance. Uh, you probably already know, but so uh, after going through that model, how would you? go by uh, solving that issue, right? So I think previous paper already had uh, the kind of method for this, but yeah, so there's not much discussion to le uh, left here, but if you have any other ideas, I will, uh, I'd be glad to hear them. Or maybe yeah, you, you, get, you just can think and uh, let me know in the end, and I'll just uh, go about uh, the proposed solution in the paper. So, yeah, the effective domain transfer uh, is in the paper done simultaneously learning features that are discriminative for the machine reading comprehension task in the source domain. And this is what SINNET have already been doing, right? And the second thing, uh, which is the contribution of this paper is to undiscriminate with respect to the shift between source and target domains. So this was already been done in the previous paper. And this is what this paper actually uh, came up with in the first end. And this paper is called ADA-MRC. And there are basically three main components that it has. The first one is the question generator, which generates the pseudo question answer pairs in the target domain. The second one is the answer module, which given an input document and a question, extracts an answer is spent from the document. And then comes the final part, which is the contribution, the domain classifier. And it basically predicts the dis uh, to distinguish if a feature vector is from the source domain or the target domain, right? So we'll start by discussing the question generator. Uh, in question generator, the possible answer spans, as I mentioned already, are extracted from the passage using the named enter cognition model. And then uh, the model consists of three uh, conse uh, consecutive layers. The first layer is the lexicon encoding. And it's basically a concatenation of uh, the glow embeddings, uh, the post tagging embeddings, and ER embeddings, and answer information, which is just one or zero, right? So it uh, basically labels the answers in the passage. Then comes the BioLSTM encoding, which provides the contextual embedding uh, for the uh, upcoming layer. And finally, we have a simple LSTM decoder, uh, which has the attention and copy mechanism. So, the overall thing that the question generation uh, the question generator learns is the conditional probability uh, of the question conditioned on passage and answer, right? And uh, since uh, the LSTM decoder has the copy mechanism uh, built in as well, the generation probability of a question token, QT, becomes the sum of generating it from the vocabulary or copying it from the passage, right? So then comes the machine reading comprehension module. 
The first two encoder layers are same with quest, uh, and shared with question generator, which are lexicon and BioLSTM encodings. Uh, followed is the cross attention layer, uh, which uh, which is used for the fusion of the question and document. Right. So it, what it does is it basically finds the related portions of the question and the document, and vice versa. And for doing that, it finds the working memory of the passage by, through the cross attention and also working memory of the question. And that is through the self attention, the question itself. And in the end, uh, as you might expect, the answer module is basically just the learned conditional probability of answer conditioned on the passage and question. So then comes the real contribution of the paper, which is a domain classifier. And what it does is it takes both domain and target encoder outputs as the input. And the passage representation is just, as we told, cross attention output. And the question representation is self attention output. Then uh, it predicts a domain label, so either target or domain, uh, from the conditional probability conditioned on passage and question. So after we all we have all these three uh, components, the training go starts with the pre-training done on the source domain, uh, which is followed by the question generation training, right? And after we have this question generator trained, we can now create the synthetic data in the target domain. We then uh, load our pre-trained weights uh, that we have learned in the second step and start the training. And in the training, what we do is we train on a mixture of source and synthetic target data. And I think someone mentioned uh, earlier that the synthetic data might be noisy, which is actually a, co a quite correct point. And in order to solve that, uh, basically uh, authors uh, do one thing, which is to use the synthetic data to only upload the weights of the domain classification, right? So, uh, they don't use it in uh, decoding the weights, in learning the weights of the decoder, but just to learning the weights of domain classification. And this is something that Synnet didn't do, which we will come into uh, later in the results. So yeah, for the experiments, they use three different benchmarks. The first one is uh, SCOD, the second NewsQA, and the third MS Marco. And yeah, evaluation measures are F1 and EM uh, for SCUD and NewsQ, and for MS Marco, they just uh, report Bleu and Rugel. So for the results, they are uh, comparing four different models. And uh, the first one is SEN, which is uh, pre-trained on the source domain to answer the questions in the target domain. So there's basically no fine tuning. It is just uh, direct, uh, direct transfer. The second one is uh, SYNNET is used to generate pseudo target domain data, which is followed by SEN fine tuning on this uh, synthetic data. The third model is what they're proposing, uh, what we have just went through. And the fourth one is the proposed model combined with the ground truth questions. And this uh, fourth model basically uh, acts as an upper bound because it uses the ground truth questions in the target domain. So if you check the results, you would see that uh, the proposed model actually does uh, quite well in all uh, four cases for transfers. And I think in the previous uh, presentation, one thing that was mentioned that SQUAD and NewsQ were uh, quite similar to each other. And this paper uh, actually, although doesn't show any visuals, they kind of do a hypothesis that that is the case because the increase in from squat to new or new to squat is quite high. Whereas between squat and MS Marco, it's not the same, right? And uh, so one important observation that the authors make here is that the baseline uh, SAN actually does better than combination of SYNNET and SAN in all four cases, right? And they uh, basically hypothesize that this is due to the noisy training that SYNNET does, right? So unlike the, uh, unlike the training the ADMRC does, SYNNET uh, uses the synthetic target data both uh, to uh, 
to basically train the decoder weights, right? And this uh, is in a way hurting the performance in a negative way. So uh, one other thing they show in the experiments is that they, they want to show the model is uh, independent of the MRC system used. And in order to show that they use, uh, they replicate the same experiment with using the BIDEF rather than SAN system. And you can see that both in uh, exact match and uh, F1, the proposed system is still able to uh, show performance gain. And in the below uh, of the figure, you can see the plotted uh, representations of uh, data in from both target and uh, source source sets. And you can see that in ADMRC, the data is much more correlated compared to SYNNET, which was the uh, which was the motivation of the paper from the beginning. So before I end, I uh, yeah, I want to show some uh, yeah examples that the paper shows, the paper talks about, and these are uh, yeah. I mean, in general, the generated questions are longer uh, than human written questions, and the paper uh, hypothesizes that this is probably due to the copy mechanism that they use, and although the copy mechanism in general uh, increases the accuracy of the questions, it also comes up with the burden of uh, making them longer. And uh, also questions are usually in good correspondence and are fluent in most of the examples, but they can sometimes make semantic errors, such as, uh, as you can see here in the first example, uh, the question asks how many people are, how, how many people fled uh, the refugee region to Sudan? Yeah, uh, to Sudan. But in the actual passage, uh, actually people not fled to Sudan, but from Sudan to Chad. And these kind of examples are basically the reason why uh, they don't choose to uh, train on the pseudo questions, uh, train uh, the decoder on the pseudo questions, because as you can see, they might be noisy and semantically not coherent. So in conclusion, there are, uh, I think, three take-home messages. First is that uh, directly transferring a model from one domain to another could hurt the performance of the pre-trained model due to domain variance. And it actually helps to incorporate a mechanism in the model that makes it realize this distinction. And synthetic data can be used to help the model interpret this distinction. However, there is one thing to note, which is uh, using synthetic data on directly on on the encoder training might lower the performance if the generation process is noisy. So yeah, uh, overall, I think that's all about it. But if you have any questions, I think we have still time for the questions. Okay, haha, -ha, nicely done. Uh, let's give a hand to haha. -ha. So uh, again, like Taha said, it, it, it um, uh, goes very well with Alex's presentation. So uh, Ifan, do you have a question to start? Uh, yeah. Uh, can you discuss the difference between this method and the previous AI method? Oh, you mean the previous presentation in here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I see. Uh, so I think the, the discriminator part is almost the same, I would say. Uh, let me show that too. Yeah. So I think this discriminator part is quite the same, but one thing I'm not sure about, uh, this model, which I guess Alex can help me with is if they use this discriminator grad, uh, in the, in the final output, right. Do they use this to increase the, uh, to learn the uh, decoder parameters or not? I think that might be the only difference between this and the solution I showed. Yeah, uh, I think it does it yeah, for this it one. Does, right? Okay, mm. so I think that's the uh, part that's different uh, mm. from this and this, because as I said, and I'll just repeat, uh, actually the, the uh, result of the domain classifier here is not used to learn the parameters in the answer module, right? So, uh, I mean, sorry, the result of the synthetic data 
is not here used to improve the answer model, but just a domain classifier, right? Because they think the uh, noisy data that was generated here might broke the answer module and actually degrade the performance. Yeah, the, the following question is why uh, just like the previous method, we can maybe use some method to select some uh, reliable, uh, re reliable pseudo data to help mm. the improve the performance. Yes, now. yeah. So you mean the the filter, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think that that might make sense, but in the paper that they don't discard that, they just uh, directly cut the synthetic data to, to be only used in the domain classifier part. Yeah, so you find, I think that makes a lot of sense. I'm sure the team tried that and it didn't work. That's why they didn't publish that section of the paper. Yeah. And sort of read between the lines. Uh, maybe they, they had a very simplistic approach that didn't work. Uh, I know a lot of people are, are, are working on this like uh, quality estimation for a uh, question generation which is uh, of course subsequent to the quality estimation of answers that came many years before when we were originally being question answering about considering uh, building pseudo data sets. Yeah. So those are really good questions. So, um, I mean, you guys can also think about uh, looking back at the, the slides that Alex and uh, Taha both presented, especially Taha went through one example on slide 32, I think um, that showed uh, questions that were generated so can you propose useful filters that could uh, pull p things out? And um, you know, Liang Ming is also working in this area, this is his direct research area. So I was also asking him earlier this week, you know, how do you distinguish between a question that's going to help your question answering system and a question that's good because it's a fluent question? You know, those two don't necessarily need to be compatible with each other. Right, so your question answering system could be a system that's good at answering certain types of questions, but uh, uh, is either lacking data or is unable to answer questions of a certain type. Right, and the whole point of using a, a, a separate question generation system just for the downstream purpose of helping question answering is different from asking questions for the sake of, you know, having good questions to ask. So those are uh, two different things. So, I mean, on this slide, you have uh, four questions and I, you know, you can analyze them a little bit. Let's, I mean, Taha, maybe you can pick one of them that you didn't cover and then we can try to dissect that and see whether we believe it's a good question and whether we think it would help a, um, a, a, uh, a question answering system have uh, more data to train on. Yeah, okay. Uh, I guess we can do it together because uh, I, this was the uh, question that was, analyzed in the paper. So that's why I uh, mentioned that specifically. But... Talked about this one, right? Yeah, yes. so I have another one that you want to, to pick? Yeah, um, I guess we can do the second one. Okay, so what do you guys think? Uh, let's, let's just have a poll. It's more fun that way, right? Okay, so we have the yes, no participants list. Does having a pseudo question like this uh, do we think it's going to help uh, the question answering system do better? Uh, why or why not? Okay, so you have to vote. Okay, this is where I, we're taking your temperature to see whether you're awake in class or whether you're sleeping on the job. So we'll give you five seconds to, to click yes or no. Okay, nobody has bothered to click no. So everyone has a reason why they think it's going to be yes. So I'm just going to uh, nominate somebody like Anab or Abdul uh, because you're both in the A section of the participants list. <laughs> so you're easy to call on. Uh, would either of you like to give a reason why you think it might be a good question uh, that's going to help? It is, there's uh, 31 of us, only uh, about half of us participate. So I can see what you are doing in the uh, Andrew, go ahead. Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe oh, because uh, in that way we can le learn uh, the 
diverse presentation or something like that. Yeah, so I think definitely when we think about using question generation to help our vocabulary, right? So if we have an additional vocabulary to pull from. Yeah, exactly. So it appears in the target, uh, the student questions, maybe that can be uh, so sort of like a summary of the, the context of um, uh, the question answering process, right? That's one thing that we can think about, right? As Taha mentioned, it's important uh, for humans to get the directionality of the question right. So, uh, you know, in the pseudo question before, we had to Sudan when it should have been from Sudan, right? That's that's the wrong one. It should be from. Uh, so uh, maybe that that hurts in some ways, and maybe it doesn't make much of a difference in other ways, depending on how your question answering system is actually uh, uh, understanding or or computing probabilities there. Okay, so I think a, a lot of these types of things uh, are, are, are quite, um, uh, you know, you, you have two different types of analyses you need to do. You have to think about um, how well the question system is doing, a uh, question answering system is doing already, right? And then contrast that with what the synthetic questions could bring in, right? And so this paper, uh, for whatever reason, chose not to, to do with that last part and just said, okay, we're just going to uh, help the dis uh, discriminator uh, distinguish domains that, right. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so um, I also want to just remind our scribe team, I know that many of you are on the document, uh, you guys can go ahead and, and start adding the content that you need, especially let's say the section headers, et cetera, um, into the document, to make it easier when you actually have to go uh, put in notes. I think the last team from week seven did a terrific job. Their notes are fairly complete. And so I urge you to do some some of the pre-work uh, this week uh, during the session right now if you can multitask. Okay, I think uh, we'll go on from there. Uh, we're a little bit uh, early. So Chun can go ahead and uh, present uh, his next paper. So Chung, I, I think you're talking, but uh, maybe, okay, yeah. Can you hear me? Uh, okay, hello everyone, uh, I'm Chung. I'm an undergraduate in NUS. Uh, I will be presenting a paper called uh, Training Question Answering Model from Synthetic Data. Uh, so this is an overview of the papers. The objective of uh, the paper is uh, try to improve the performance of a specific uh, question answering task uh, by doing data augmentations, meaning that we generate a uh, synthetic data and train a model on it. So this uh, specific type of question answering task is squat style question answering, uh, which is a type of question answering where the answer is the span of text in the context. Like if you look at the uh, example here, we have uh, context questions and the answer is uh, highlighted in red in the context. Uh, which is the span of text in the context. So uh, the uh, overall uh, data augmentation pipeline is as follow. Uh, first, uh, we have one component for context generations, and then uh, the context generation will uh, try to generate a short paragraph, uh, and then we have an answer attractions. Uh, we try to attract some span of text in the context uh, as candidate answers, uh, and then uh, we uh, generate questions uh, based on the answer in the context. And uh, and lastly, we do a uh, kind of filtrations. We try to uh, filter out like invalid questions. Okay, so uh, the first part is uh, context generations. So this can be done by like either uh, get a related corpus uh, to the task and try to sample a short paragraph from it like uniformly. Or secondly, we can uh, use a pre-trained uh, GPT-2 and fine tune it on the training data set that we have uh, and use it to generate uh, a synthetic context. Uh, the next uh, uh, component is uh, answer attractions. So as uh, mentioned by, uh, by previous, uh, I mean, in previous works, uh, uh, they use uh, noun phrases or entities as a candidate answers. Uh, in this work, they say that this uh, is not good enough uh, I mean, the, the intuition uh, that they have is that 
the synthetic data will help with the task most if it is similar to natural questions and answer of this task. Uh, like in other words, the synthetic data should be in the same domain as the natural data. So to achieve this, they, uh, they use a model to learn to extract answer from the context. So they train on the uh, available uh, label data uh, to extract uh, candidate answers. And uh, they think that it would help uh, to extract more kind of relevant answer. So this is the, uh, the detail of the models. Uh, they use BERT uh, uh, to extract answers uh, with only the contact as input. Uh, if you see in the diagram on the left, uh, the BERT models, uh, uh, the input is a con context tokens and uh, the BERT output some uh, vectors corresponding to each token in the context, uh, namely one, two, three, four. Uh, so for every span, uh, candidate spans, uh, like for example, the span that start with uh, two and ends with four, uh, they concatenate uh, these two vectors and then uh, use a, uh, the linear layers to output a single scalar, uh, which uh, represent like a score on this span, whether it's a, uh, it's a candidate um, answer or not. So for each of this uh, span, they have one scalar and they uh, put a soft mic over this to get the distributions and they train it on uh, the label data set. So when uh, they use this model to extract the candidate answers, uh, they use top case sampling. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the next component is, uh, is the question generations. So uh, they, so for example, uh, they have, uh, they, uh, I mean, Okay, so they generate questions uh, in an autoregressive uh, text generation manners. Uh, like for example, uh, given the context and answers tokens, uh, they try to autoregressively generate each word tokens in the questions. And the model that they use for this is uh, GPT-2 uh, and train it on the available data set. So one, uh, one minor detail here is that uh, when they auto aggressively uh, generate question words, they, uh, they require the structure uh, a kind of format to this uh, output. Uh, it has a special tokens like questions and colon and then colon questions. Uh, and they say that if the generated questions word doesn't have this kind of format, then they will ignore that uh, generated questions or just study the point. Uh, yeah, and the last part is, uh, is the filtrations uh, models. So the purpose of this uh, this component is to filter out invalid uh, generated data. So uh, they train a QA models on the available data set and use it to check if the generated context question answer is consistent with the model prediction or not. Uh, so specifically, uh, they train a bird model uh, and uh, given the context and question generated, then if the predicted answer and the generated answers are like the same, and they say that is a is a valid uh, their new their, their point and they keep it. Uh, so in the paper they also mentioned that uh, sometimes the bird models filter out invalid questions, uh, and they uh, just simply say that they make it better by uh, generate two questions given uh, a context and answers. Like for example, uh, they have two two chiplets like context question one answers and context question two answers. And uh, and then they uh, check if one of them is consistent with the question answering, uh, with the model operations, then both of these chiplets are kept. Uh, so so uh, the overview of the entire system is as follows. There are, there are four components. Uh, first is uh, context generators. Uh, they use a uh, GPT-2 and they fine tune it on uh, the training set. Uh, they, they have uh, uh, unconditional answer attraction models, uh, which is a uh, bird models, uh, a question generation models, which is they use a GPT-2 models and a filtration model, they use another bird models. So one comment on this uh, is my comment is that it seems to be a, a kind of complex systems and a, a wishful systems because uh, because the system rely on like good performance on each of the component to uh, do a good task. That's what I think. 
That's a good point. So, I mean, if you want to re-execute this pipeline and you don't use no GPT-2 system, just BERT, I mean, how, how well do we think it will do? So that, that's something also to keep in mind. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so uh, they performed some experiment to evaluate this uh, new uh, this synthetic layer. Uh, so they, the comparison is based on a squat uh, V1 benchmark. And they uh, try to compare between training a bird uh, models on uh, firstly is uh, only label data set, uh, squad B1. Uh, and the second is on real context, but synthetic uh, question and answers. And the third one is uh, purely uh, synthetic data, uh, uh, which means a synthetic context question and answers. So if you look at those table on, 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 the, on the right, uh, you see that, uh, that if the model trained on purely synthetic data, uh, they all get better performance than training only on, on uh, labeled layers. Uh, yeah, and secondly is that uh, using a real context or synthetic context make uh, a little bit difference, uh, which might indicate that uh, the context generator is, uh, is good. Yeah, but there's a caveat here is that you see the number of questions, uh, uh, synthetic question is like uh, 200 times more than the number of questions of uh, label data set we have. So I think that uh, in order to need, have this kind of uh, good performance, I need to have a lot of uh, synthetic data. Okay, uh, so uh, in the paper, they also mentioned about the squad V2 task, uh, a squad V2 benchmark. So the squad V2 benchmark is uh, similar to the squad V1, but uh, it now requires the model to know when the uh, uh, when the question is non-answerable. So uh, the authors, uh, and so this paper, they uh, train model on synthetic uh, data set with no non-answerable no non questions, and then fine tune it on squad v v2. And uh, and this uh, system give better performance, if, uh, even that the synthetic data doesn't have any non-answerable questions. And uh, this work also uh, be better than all the, uh, previous work at the time. Uh, okay, so there are two components that's uh, important to these systems. Uh, so one is uh, answer attraction models. So as uh, I mentioned previously that the author uh, say using a uh, noun phrase or entity uh, as the candidate answer is not enough and they uh, try to justify it by, uh, by, by doing an experiment by replacing the answer generator with uh, the NER uh, and then compare. And we see that the, uh, the, the performance of uh, using NER as a generator is, uh, is uh, less than the uh, performance of uh, using a bird model to uh, attract the answers by a large margin. Yeah, and, uh, and then another important component is uh, filtration models. So, uh, so uh, they try to compare between not using a filtration models or using it. And we can see that in this uh, table, uh, having a filtration model can give like a boost in performance in uh, seven points in EM score. Uh, that is a big uh, amount. Yeah. And, uh, and the strategy that uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, which is to generate two questions uh, per context and answers. And uh, this strategy gives a slight boost in performance. Yeah, so, uh, so, so the key to take away here is that uh, with advancement in a good language model uh, now, uh, it, it actually makes it possible to have a, a synthetic uh, model to uh, create a good uh, text, good data, and thus enable uh, to train a good question answering model purely on synthetic data. Uh, but however, we, uh, the quality of the data is uh, not, not yet uh, that high, uh, that not that cool, so we still need to uh, uh, have a lot of uh, synthetic data to have better performance. And uh, lastly, is uh, uh, is that to have a good performance on a specific task, uh, it is critical uh, to model the answer distribution of the task, uh, which is a component like answer attraction. Yeah, uh, I think this uh, end of the presentation. Uh, any questions? Okay. Thanks, Jung, for the presentation.
So uh, we are quite ahead of time, which is great. Um, but uh, I think hopefully you guys have questions. Do you have any questions for Trum? Uh, yeah, well, uh, so uh, like uh, which data set they use to train the answer extraction task? Uh, so answer extraction task, uh, so here the experiment on uh, on squad view and benchmark. So the squad has a, a label data set. So uh, they train the model on uh, this uh, squad view and data set. You mean they use a squad data set to train the answer extraction task? Yes. Uh, so like more specifically in the paper, they try not to like uh, look at the test set. They buy, so they uh, divide the squad uh, data set in two half and just train the answer attractor on one half of this uh, squad data set. Uh, but so, so this means that they, they, train the, they train the answer extraction task on squad and they then evaluate the model on, on, uh, on squad data set again? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, so I think this is the, if, if they did it in this way, I think it is a little bit tricky because in this way, uh, they actually can uh, assume that they know the answer distribution of the squad data set. Uh, so uh, uh, because they use the squad data set to train the answer extraction model. Yes. Uh, yeah, and, and, they, and they then uh, like evaluate, also evaluate on the squad data set. So, so which means that the, uh, the synthesized questions uh, should have a similar answer extraction, uh, answer distribution with the squad data set, right? Yes, that is true. Uh, that's also a point that the author uh, say uh, that uh, in order to have good performance on the on a specific task, you need to model its answer distributions. Okay, all right. But I guess if they don't claim that they can generalize to an unseen distribution, then that's fine, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so this is in a, a transfer paper, right? This is just uh, seeing how, how you can use the question generation to, to help with question answering. So they're making a, you know, the, the, the strong assumption that you have enough data to characterize the answer distribution, right? And then use that information to, in the filtration process in part to make sure that you have uh, things that actually help the question answering system do better, right? Yep. So actually, it's quite interesting that a lot of people are still using Squad 1 instead of Squad 2. Because I think Squad 1 has been shown to be very easy and like contain a lot of spurious patterns that uh, the models can exploit. Whereas uh, Squad 2 is a lot harder because you have to kind of guess whether the question is uh, answerable or not, right? Yeah. So it, it's quite strange that everyone is still using Squad One, even though, like, it's been shown that Squad One is an easy data set. Yes. Uh, so I think uh, actually they they compare the model on Squad Two as well. Uh, but the main reason why they use Squad One is uh because this uh data augmentation pipeline doesn't really generate uh, unanswerable questions. Yeah, that's my guess. Yeah, it probably does actually generate unanswerable questions because you know all the questions don't actually do that well in question generation, but uh, probably it's not highlighted uh, as much. Yeah, so there's a lot of work I think on trying to figure out what are the right questions to generate, and I think uh, Alex's paper at the beginning said you know an adversarial method might be a good way forward because then you know whether the data is actually helping you with the question generation. Uh, the question generation process is actually helping you with the question answering process, right? Because otherwise you don't need to generate a question that's not helping you get some data to answer questions more effectively. So the filtration process is actually very important. Yes. Other comments So uh, very nice. So I, I think uh, Chung's comments about, you know, the the validity of this particular architecture on, uh, you know, other downstream experiments are, are definitely uh, an issue. I mean, because NLP is evolving, especially question answering, and, and nowadays question generation is changing so quickly, we expect a, a lot of uh, techniques that 
and didn't have very good performance before to be, um, you know, come come into their own um, after things get better. I mean, we, we see this with GPT and GPT-2 and GPT-3, um, you know, just uh, a larger model um, making much better performance in certain techniques that were not viable before become viable now, right? So this uh, filtration process is very important when you're bootstrapping or you have low domain resources, but uh, probably not so important once you have good uh, question generation processes in place. Other questions? I, I think it's it's useful to have more discussion. So I encourage you to take a look at the paper and think about how the filtration process is working. Uh, even in your own models, like some of you are in, in other communities where the domain is very different from, you know, general question answering. Um, how, how does the data quality in your fields or uh, domain applications, um, would it need uh, question fil filtration if you were building an MRC fish system for, let's say, biomedical um, question answering and things of this sort? Yeah, so uh, yeah, maybe another question about the uh, uh, filtration. I can go back to the slides. Uh, the the round trip, uh, the round trip filtration. It is this slide. Yeah, yeah, this slide. So if I understand correctly, this means that uh, uh, if a generated question like can be answered correctly by the QA model, then it is considered valid, right? Yeah. So, uh, so the so the QA model they use uh, is the same one. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, it, it, it is the same one that they are trying to optimize. Uh, yeah. So this QA model is trained on the available data with uh, without any synthetic data, like a baseline model like that. Uh, so it is a fixed uh, baseline model, or the, or the one that uh, it is uh, like jointly optimizing with this process. Uh, it is a fixed model trained on only uh, real data, available data. Oh, I see, I see. So their initial question answering system is not the one that's uh, evolving with the process. So yeah, so it is a fixed one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't make sense, yeah. Yeah, because I'm considering that if uh, if we if this is not a fixed QA model, but it's the same one that uh, we are optimizing, I, I think this is not valid. Be, be, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, because uh, uh, if if the generated question uh, can already be answered by the model that you are trying to train, uh, th then what's then what is the point to include it as uh, additional training data? So <laughs> so so. Yeah, if the if this is not a fixed QA model, then I think it is it is not correct. Yeah, I agree. You can consider also multi-view systems where you involve uh, this process uh, in in two parallel threads, right? And uh, whatever is generated by one question generator uh, could be used to help the other uh, opposing question answering system. So you have uh, two two systems. Um, training simultaneously, but generating their own data um, that would help a, a classifier on the other opposite side. So that multi-view um, technique is used in a, a couple different uh, areas, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So being able to, to do this effectively, I guess, uh, do you think of generative adversarial networks or anything of this adversarial sort? Generally, you need to make sure that uh, you're not uh, falling too far away from your original task being taken in there. And then you also need to make sure that uh, you do things in such a way um, that, what was I saying? Um, yeah, I, I've lost my train of thought, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, other questions? 
Oh yeah. So I was I was thinking about simulated annealing, right? Where you uh, gradually turn down the temperature of uh, evolution process, so that you you uh, allow a lot of exploration at the beginning, um, and then when you get a good gradient or, or a good uh, sense of uh, the direction that helps, then you turn down the temperature so that you get the process uh, moving in a certain direction appropriately. So I, I think the same thing is happening in question generation, right? You can generate, uh, generate lots of questions at the beginning. Some of them will be noisy, so we don't want to update our, our question answering model. We just want to uh, update the domain classifier um, so we can use the information that way. But over uh, you know, a period of time, maybe the system gets good enough that we can trust that the generate questions are actually not so bad. And that uh, if we have a filtration process, we can actually use that to enhance the original question answering system. So um, this type of evolution or evolutionary process could also be uh, useful. Okay, uh, do we have any other questions before we uh, go to the last presenter? Okay, well, we're 10 minutes early, so that's good. So we'll go on, let's thank Chung again. Okay, and uh, we'll go on to our last presentation by, I think, Yajing. So Yajing, you can uh, unmute and turn on your screen share and you're, you're good to go. Um, hi, uh, today I'm going to present um, the, a paper, the title of Asking Questions, The Human Way, Scalable Question Answer Generation from Text Corpus. So um, yeah, it's also a paper uh, released recently this year, and it was accepted by ACM. Um, so the motivation of this work is that uh, um, the previous answer aware questions generation are uh, using a one-to-one -one mapping from um, the passage class uh, answer to the question. And they are claiming that passages and questions are one-to-many mapping. So um, they try to, they are trying to mimic the human way to ask questions. Um, what that means is that uh, they uh, given a sentence. So uh, we will first of all, we, as a human, we will first of all identify the answer that we want to ask about and then find a clue from this sentence. Uh, for example, uh, in this case, it will be uh, offset. Uh, the answer will be um, MTV movie award for best fight. And um, the clue will be from um, the movie Obsessed. And then we identify what kind of style is uh, suitable for these uh, questions, which is which, and then form the questions um, here, a uh, fight scene from the movie Obsessed won which award. Yeah. And actually from one sentence, many, uh, many, like name entity can be identified as the as the answer, and then each answer can also be constrained by different clues and um, asked in different styles. For example, when and uh, how, uh, for example, what or uh, how. Sometimes uh, some of the, the questions can be asked in different ways um, with different styles. This is the overall structure of the model. So we have uh, we have a, a, a module to generate the data set because uh, for all the QA data set uh, available, they are in the form of passage, um, question, and answer. So we need to generate the things, the clue and style that is missing in the original data set and. Uh, so that we can use to train our, our answer uh, 
clue style a well uh, question generation model. And um, with the training directly, you also need the, the, the we also need the model, uh, the, the, we also need the other informations from the passage uh, that we have. So we need to sample the answer as well as the clue and style from um, the input passage or sentence in this case. And um, so uh, with that, we will need to train the model. Um, they, they actually propose two kinds of model. One is a sequence to sequence model. The other one is, is just to fine tune the GPT-2 model. And um, um, the question and answer uh, passage question answer pair will then be in, put into a filter. And uh, those uh, remains after the filter will be um, will be output as the generated Q's question um, passage answer pair. So um, what is exactly this thing called crew? So it so so it's actually uh, so how do we generate this crew? It's actually by pass and trunk the candidate uh, the sentence into different chunks so that we have a set of uh, candidate chunks. And um, then we tokenize and stem the stem uh, the passages chunk and get the and and the in, input questions and then keep only the content content words. Then compute the similarity between the um, the candidate chunk as and the uh, in, input questions. And then we have we will have uh, overlapping. Um, we will compare the overlapping of words and stems. And also uh, a soft cop a, a, a concept called soft copy by uh, looking at the synonyms and similar words. Then, um, then based on the similarity, uh, those chunk with the highest score will be used as clue. So it's basically basically the thing that we um, we include in the question to constrain um, the the answer to be the answer that uh, given in the, in the, that we want to have. So the style is, is solely based on uh, what the thing that to be, uh, to be answered. So if it's, if it's, if it's a name, then it's, uh, it's who and where and when, yeah, and so on and so forth. And so, so for uh, questions start with M is worth well, uh, this kind of question will be classified as yes, yes or no. And the rest of the questions is classified as other. So we in total we have, we have nine kind of nine styles. So now, um, so this is to process the training data set um, to have the two additional information to be uh, used as input for the training. But we also need to process the uh, passages to generate the the answer. Um, style and the, and the clue. So, <clears throat> so they make three assumptions. So first of all, the, the answer, the probability of uh, a trunk being an answer is based on the part of speech uh, of that answer, the name entity of the answer and the, uh, the, the part of speech of the trunk, the name entity, uh, the name entity of the trunk and the length of the trunk. So, um, so after we compute the probability of the answer, and then we can so then we can draw the answer based on this. We can draw the answer uh, of from the passage based on the this probability distribution. Then after that, uh, they also they make another assumption that the the style is solely based on the 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 answer. So uh, the style is based on the part of speech of the answer as well as the name of the answer uh, we draw. Then uh, the clue is based on, is based on um, the part of speech of the trunk, like uh, the, those candidate trunks, and then, and then the name entity of that trunk and the distance, uh, the something called dependency distance between the, con the clue and the answer. So this is the, the dependency distance is just the first 
first token of the uh, clue and the first token of the answer. Then, um, then with all this, so this this three um, probability distribution are actually um, generated from the from a, a given data set. For example, here they use squared v one point one as the input, and then they read and train uh, the data train on the data set on this data set. So uh, for each line. They will get. Uh, they were. They were uh, passed them, pass and chunk them to and get the uh, tag, um, including like the, the part of switch tag, the uh, name entity tag, and the length and the and the uh, clue tag and the dependence distribution as well as the style. So and then compute all these um, distributions by a grid histo histogram. And then for each new sentence, sentence, uh, and then for this sentence, new sentence is the uh, is the sentence from the um, the new text um, that we want to generate a question and answer pair. Um, so for each of the new sentence, we will pass, we will perform the passing, and then get all the possible answers based on the uh pro get all the possible answers uh, by trunk. Trunking them, uh, trunking them in into different chunks, and then calculate the uh, answer probability based on like how likely is this chunk to be an, an valid answer, uh, based on the distribution here, and then um, normalize it, and then sample five different uh, answers. And then for each answer, also get all the uh, possible clue chunks based on this. Uh, this distribution and also uh, for each clue where uh, we're sample a uh, two question type yeah so with that we we are ready to look at the models so they propose two two models one is sequence to sequence based so for the sequence to sequence based the, the input they use is a concatenation of the word vector the embedding of the name entity tag and as part of speech tag, and uh, whether it's a content word. And then the encoder they use is a bidirectional bi bi uh, GIU, and the decoder they use is a GIU with attention and copy me mechanism. The other model they use is GPT-2 uh, uh, transformer-based language model. So they uh, actually form a form a, a input with um, a token called VLS, and then crew, and then answer, and to 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 in between to to start the, the like for example passage and start a crew with a crew token, yeah, and so on and so forth. Then um, yeah, then then do a segment embedding and uh, as well as the, the word embedding and position embedding to be the input to the GPT-2 language model. After that, uh, if, you, if you still remember the, the model, they actually, had, they actually also have a filter um, module and this filter module is built with two parts. One is a bird-based entitlement model trained use trained with Squat uh, 2.0. So the reason with Squat 2.0 is because the, there are uh, questions that have no answer. So um, the the purpose for this entitlement model is to um, to check whether the question and answer pair generated matches the content of the input passage. And then for the other the other part is a bird based question answer model, and if so the the so if a uh, if the answer uh, generated by this bird based QA model uh, the similarities the F one similarity score between the actual answer and the uh, like this code answer here is the is actually also the inputs from uh, like the answer generated from the model and uh, 
and the uh, answer span uh, predicted by this QA model, uh, if the similarity score is above 0 0.9, then this, um, this ask question answer pair will be kept. And now we are, we'll be looking at the result. As we can see here, the, the uh, six to six model um, performs significantly better compared to the rest. But I think one of the reasons is like, uh, like what Yang Yang was mentioned uh, in previous presentation. Um, they actually use all these um, uh, model, uh, model that trained um, with squared data um, and then measure the performance on the squared data as well. So it's kind of, um, you, are, you, are, you are kind of knowing what kind of um, questions to be asked and then, and then, and then generate the question um, uh, and then keep only this kind of uh, questions. So it's kind of expected that the result is better. So, um, so I think the other uh, evaluation that is more useful is actually the human evaluation. So um, most of the, um, so they actually have uh, hired 10 graduates, if I'm not wrong. So, uh, and ask them to, to ask, ask them to um, label five, five samples, like 200 samples from uh, the six to six model, 200 more, 200 samples from the GPT-2 model and 100 from the uh, ground truth. So um, the result shows that uh, the questions generated by the GPT-2 model is more well-formed, like 74% uh, compared to the 40% uh, by six to six model. This is also expected because the GPT-2 model uh, has already, it is a pre-trained with, it's a model pre-trained with all the, um, all the other, uh, it's like more knowledgeable about how a sentence, sentence should, be, should be like, and then uh, whether the question is relevant. And uh, yeah, so for whether the question is relevant, the six to six model is you know, performs better, but then whether the answer is correct, actually they are kind of similar because they are, the answer is, uh, generated based on the based on the uh, the question is generated based on the answer yeah um, so so uh, another thing to be noted is is that uh, most of the error are actually gram grammar error or type mismatch for example um, asking uh, the answer is a name and then the, the question is when and then or, or minimal minus but the, I think the first two uh, consists of like 80 to 90% of the uh, unwell-formed questions. Yeah. And this is an example of uh, the question answer pair being generated. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so because of the more control way of uh, generating the, the questions, so the question is expected to be more diverse. For example, you were asked uh, like when, which, and what, uh, what, yeah, yeah, in this case, because there's no, no time here. So, um, uh, yeah, so like, for example, for this sentence, there will be, you, you, will, you, will, you will use um, different things as the answer. For example, here is the life science, and then the crew will be Manhattan, and then the, the, the style will be what. So the other result they, they presented in the experiment part is, the, is the, the result from the, uh, like the QA model performance with the additional generated data. Um, and the result shows that actually it's, it's, it's not improved. It doesn't um, show any improvement in, in, and actually uh, the performance is, is even worse with the generated data. And they claim that the performance drop was because uh, first of all, the generated data set contains noises. And also if most of the, the, the answers um, has been 
like the content covered by the generated uh, training data is already been answered, covered by the original data set, then um, adding more data doesn't really help the performance. Um, yeah, that's, that's all for my presentation. Um, okay, thanks Niaching for your presentation. Uh, so do we have questions from anyone? Shinza, go ahead. Oh, thank you, thank you. So, so I have a question on um, page uh, 52 for uh, calculating the probabilities. Uh, in fact, I don't quite understand, like, cause you know, for especially answer and clue is a chunk instead of a word. So, uh, I mean, different words, of course, they have different uh, part, part of speech or name entity. So how, how do you, how, how is the probability actually calculated under these settings? Um, can can you be more clear about what you mean by how is it calculated? Like, it, it, is it like, let, let's say, uh, for for uh, for for a chunk of answers, so it's probably a few sentences or a, a few words, and is it like? Calculating a multiplication of the uh, let's say for cases a uh, probability of a given power of speech of this a and and yeah of a so is it like multiplication like it, it multiplies the uh, the probability for each word? Yes, actually this part is quite tricky. I think uh, in this paper because uh, this uh, I think the, uh, I. This joint probability is estimated based on the, uh, the data in the squad data set. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, uh, for example, P uh, uh, P S given A and P means that, uh, for example, given each possible combination of post tagging and NER types in the squad data set to calculate the probability of a given S. Uh, this is just uh, estimated based on the data on the squad to get this distribution. Oh, oh I, see, I see. Yeah, so yeah, so so like like I just said, uh, this part like is tricky because it assumes that it knows the distribution of the squad and then yeah. it evaluates also on the squad. Yeah. So so for the for results it will be actually more interesting if they evaluate this kind of uh, distribution um, on other they are set like without uh, um, using the information there. So, so I assume the distribution will be quite different, like for another different data set. Right? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So, uh, so, so I don't think they can like transfer this to another data set. Oh. Uh, but uh, I think the key point of this paper just. Uh, uh, is, is that they, they want to show that uh, if you can like uh, correctly extract the clues or and the question styles, uh, then uh, question generation is uh, more of a genera uh, more of an extractive problem rather than a generative problem. Yeah, because if you already know what content should be included in a question, then uh, to generate a question is, is, is a relatively easy task. So, so the hard part is actually not the generation, but the extraction. That is to know how. That is to know what should be included in a question. Uh, what uh, so what what content should be asked, uh, and uh, what 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 uh, what contents are, uh, are naturally asked by human, and what, what contents are not. Uh, so, so I think this is the key point of this paper, and also uh, the one that I like. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. And and also in their recommendation, actually, um, um, yeah, in order to use it on, on other data sets to, to generate, um, like to apply this method on other kind of uh, sets, they will require a, a small amount. I don't, I don't, I, I'm not sure how, how big the data sets is, should be, but they will require a, a label data set for them to generate all this information. Okay. Mm. Thank you.
Yeah, uh, Liao Ming has also shared this paper with me before, so it's good to see uh, both of you add in uh, content on this. Um, any other people have questions? So I think you see that there's a, a dichotomy here. This one is, uh, as it says in the paper title that Yao Jing put up at the beginning, you know, this is about asking human questions, right? The human way. So it doesn't claim to help any downstream process, right? It just says, can we ask more naturalistic questions? And for that, we want to study the distributional, distributional properties of a corpus with respect to what uh, Liang Ming and uh, Ya Jing both said, which is like, what are the key parts of the question, right? And the generation process is just filling in the holes, right? Just saying, okay, I know this is there. I know this is there. What's a natural thing that I can use? So sort of like reverse Mad Libs, if you know what Mad Libs are, right? Mad Libs, you, you basically delete the content word and then you're supposed to fill in, it, uh, it in to make a funny story. In this way, we're, we're generating the Mad Lib part and we have the content already put in. Yeah, so it's uh, quite different. I think, uh, yeah, there are some peaking issues that uh, both of you brought up, you know, where you're allowed to, somehow you shouldn't be looking at the data distribution of what you're trying to predict. Uh, but uh, I think it's, it's okay in this case because we're not claiming uh, better performance. Right, so there's a uh, you know uh, two different tasks here. You know, if you want to ask questions to humans, of course you have to generate it to help humans be able to read it. Uh, but if you're trying to ask questions to help a question answering system, well, that's a whole different ballgame because how question generation systems work is somewhat orthogonal to what uh, how humans think about questions and what they consider plausible or not. Right. Um, in the paper also, they, they, they show you these very nice uh, uh, heat maps uh, of the uh, distribution of answer NERs, answer lengths, and, and distances, uh, which uh, you can get at if you want. Or I, I can also share the screen and you can see that for a second. Yeah, so I think you can see this graph here, right? So this says the number of words in the answer. And then you have the NER tag of the answer on the side over here, right? So you can see it's uh, very much uh, the case where answers are pretty short, except for uh, when they're not really sure about the type of the answer, then it could be pretty long, right? And then here, the distance between the answer and the clue, uh, again, for certain types of things that are longer, we expect a, uh, slightly longer cases, um, but they, they all gravitate to being a bit short. And the one I think is the most interesting is about the style, right? So depending on what type of uh, question type you're asking, it, uh, we all know this from question answering too, it definitely corresponds to the NER of the answer. So whether this generalizes or not past quad 1.0, uh, I guess somebody could go uh, draw these graphs again for hot pot QA or dream or anything like that. It would be very interesting to see whether these types of things uh, well, I don't expect them to hold out entirely, but it would be nice to know what the, the salient differences are between these. Okay. So other questions that you guys have? All right, so uh, I think with that, we've come to the end, end of our really, really short core of MRC and uh, you know data augmentations for that. Um, I want to thank both of our uh, presenting teams and scribes in week seven and week eight for their efforts. And uh, now we're uh, squarely in the second half of the semester and we have our, our second uh, batch of PhD students coming in. So I hope uh, you guys are all attending to the deadlines in the course, which are this week to put up the abstracts, which we've already done for the most part. Um, and then I will uh, give them some critiques. And then uh, going forward, you'll get more information from me and as well as steps uh, on uh, going forward. Uh, again, the projects are meant to get your hands dirty. It's a, a, also a way for you to network with other people, both inside of SOC and outside of SOC so that you have more of a community draw. I think, you know, Singapore is really one of the hot spots uh, of uh, artificial intelligence and natural language processing research. And I hope uh, you use these ties very well uh, into your upcoming years of, of study, uh, whether or not you're a PhD student or undergraduate or even an external participant. Okay, so I don't think uh, there's anything else from me. And so we can end a little early. How about that? Okay, so uh, we have 10 minutes uh, 
for you to have fun before your next uh, three o'clock appointments. Okay, so thanks for again, spending your afternoon uh, with us. We'll see you next week. Next week, I think we're doing conversational recommendation systems if I'm not wrong. I could be completely wrong. So let me just check. Yes, we are doing conversational recommendation systems. So we'll see you next week. Okay, bye everyone. Thank you. Thanks for all our presenters.